Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Albert Decker in In Old Oklahoma. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. First, there was prairie and roving bands of the Plains Indians. Then there were white men, and the plain was broken by the plow. And then one day, a trickle of oil came from the earth, and strange wooden towers rose across the land. The black gold gushed from the ground, and from all over America, men raced to get their share. So it was in every place where they found the black gold. And so it was in Oklahoma, in the days when men made fortunes overnight and fought at the drop of a hat. Republic Pictures made a roaring screen drama on the subject, and we've chosen it as tonight's play. It's called In Old Oklahoma. And the picture was based on the thompson Burtis story, War of the Wildcats. You'll hear Martha Scott and Albert Decker from the picture cast plus a young man who makes his first appearance in the Lux Radio Theater tonight. Roy Rogers, the king of the cowboys. Roy sings a mighty sweet song in his pictures, and his pictures play a mighty sweet tune at the box office. They tell me this kind of play is very popular with the boys on the fighting fronts. We've also discovered, by way of the V-mail route, that Lux toilet soap is uh, popular out there, too. Perhaps, like me, you've often wondered what baggage a paratrooper carries when he jumps behind enemy lines. And that's about the biggest adventure any man can embark on. Well, I have a V-mail note here, signed by three of the lads who wear the paratroop wings. And they say that the night they jumped in Sicily, they all had a cake of Lux in their toilet kits. And that certainly, that certainly is a spectacular way for Lux toilet soap to arrive on the island of Sicily. And it's quite possible they're hearing tonight's play over there. So we'll raise the curtain on the first act of In Old Oklahoma, starring Roy Rogers as Dan Summers, Martha Scott as Kathy, and Albert Decker as Jim Gardner. <laughs> Oklahoma's floating in. I heard of a fellow that made $78,000 off in two acres of oil land. We got a chance to be millionaires. This here oil boom makes a land rush look like little casino. Oil. 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 It's 1906, and a train jammed with workers bound for Oklahoma's fabulous new oil fields comes to a reluctant stop at the tiny town of Claiborne. A solitary passenger waits at the station surrounded by a half dozen red-faced women and a single woe-begone young man. No, Mother. No, ladies, please. Just for one second, Mother. Ladies, will you kindly shut up? Now, Kathy, you don't have to leave Claiborne. Please don't go. Let go of my hand, Walter. I'm going to miss the train. But you can live all this down. I don't want to live it down. I just want to live. Kathy, tell them you'll never write another book. Tell them you're sorry and they'll forgive you. But I'm not sorry. I'm glad. But, Kathy... If you leave Claiborne, we can't get married. Married? I forbid it. No woman who writes such novels will ever call me mother. Uh, you, uh, uh, you! Jezebel's the word, Mrs. Ames, but don't worry. I'm leaving Claiborne for good. We're running you out of town. I'm yeah. leaving of my own free will. I'll live as I choose and I'll write as I choose. For the first time in my life, I'll be free. Goodbye. But you can't do this, Kathy. Oh, Kathy! Kathy! Well, come on in. What? Oh, where am I? This is my private car, little lady. Oh, paintings and books. So beautiful. I should say you are. Excuse me, I'll get right out. But there isn't a seat on the train, nor any other ladies. But somewhere there's sure to be a gentleman. <laughs> Frankly, I doubt it. You see, this is an oil train. We're going to my oil fields at Sepulpa. That kind of work needs tough men, and that's just what those cars up ahead are filled with. Oh. So why don't you sit down here and be comfortable? Why, 
You must be Mr. James E. Gardner. That's right. And while I don't know your name, I know you're an author and that you're going to be free. Oh, you heard? Pretty hard not to hear. Is, um, is that your book you're carrying? Yes. Hmm. A Woman Dares by Catherine Allen. Uh-huh. Catherine Allen. Now, let's see. Catherine? No. Katie? Now, you don't look like a Katie. Let me see now. Kitten. Yes, that's it. Kitten. Kitten? A baby wildcat. Fits you perfectly. And now that you've agreed to share my private car, I'll start collecting the payment. One little kiss. (gasps) Now, why on earth did you slap me? Why does a woman usually slap a man? You are a wildcat. Not nearly as wild as you apparently think, Mr. James E. Gardner. Oh, I'm not a Jezebel. I'm not even a good imitation of one. I'm a school teacher. <laughs> a school teacher? <laughs> then if you don't stop laughing, I'll slap your face again. Oh, I'm sorry. Where are you bound for, kitten? Kansas City. So I can experience some of the things I've been writing about. So people can't say school teacher the way you just did. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. Now come on, give me a chance to square myself. You know, kitten, you can't learn about life in Kansas City. You should come to Sepulpa. I'll show you more in five minutes than you can see in Kansas City in ten years. I simply don't know what to make of you. Well, I just... Oh, uh, excuse me. I guess I should have not. What is this, cowboy? A hold-up? Yeah, for a seat, mister. This is a private car. I know, but I'm awful tired. Cherokee! If you're calling for your engine bodyguard, he's up ahead playing poker. You see, mister, my horse died under me about ten miles out of Claiborne, and I figured by now I've carried this saddle just about long enough. And look, Mr. Gardner, he's an ex-soldier. Oh, you notice the pants? It's your duty as a citizen, Mr. Gardner, to let him sit down. I guess you're right, kitten. Sit down. Where are you going? You know, that's the very question I was arguing out with my horse just before he died. Where are you bound for, miss? Kansas City. Always wanted to go to Kansas City. I, I guess maybe that's where I am going. Oh, Is that a box lunch over there? That's right. Anybody mind? No, go right ahead. Well, you folks just pick up where you left off, and I'll just get off over here in the corner with this cold turkey. (laughs) Well, kitten, shall we take his advice? Yes, if you really want to live, you mustn't be afraid to take a chance. Just remember to leap first and look afterwards. That's what happened to my horse. He broke his neck. Uh, As you were saying, Mr. Gardner. Yes. Well... Take my town, for example, Sepulpa. It used to be just a dust-covered prairie with nothing but... Oh, boy. Hey, you're going to have to excuse me, folks. It's this here book, A Woman Dares. What's so funny about that book? Well, listen to this. They kissed, and the sun and the moon and the stars reeled around us. Silliest thing ever heard. (laughs) An author is entitled to poetic license. Ain't nobody (laughs) entitled to run that whole while. Now, Now, let's see. It says... And so Julia realized she now stood at the crossroads. Julie. Uh, Yes, ma'am. Which way shall she turn? One road leads to John and dull security, and the other to Roger Hale and exciting adventure. Oh, he's ruining it. Read it to yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) Yes, I've known plenty of women, kitten, but I've never wanted to ask any of them what I've asked you. Get off its sepulchre with me. If my hunch is right, you'll never be sorry. Mr. Gardner, you've known me for exactly two hours and ten minutes. And And if my hunch is wrong, there's always another train to Kansas City. But I couldn't. Why not? Aren't you Catherine Allen, the novelist? Yes, but, well, if someone were with me, alone, I I couldn't think of. Boy, I just can't stand any more of this here book. I'll bet whoever wrote it is a dried-up old maid who'd run a mile if a man ever even looked at it. So that's your opinion, is it? It sure is. You know, I once had the idea the girl in that book was warm and beautiful and courageous. But yes, I guess you're right, cowboy. Well, for junction. Well, here where I get off. Looks like we're at the crossroads, kitten. How did it go in the novel? One road led to John and Dull security and the other well, two... Well, for junction. You see? Thank you, Mr. Gardner, but I'm still going to Kansas City. Oh, how long does the train stop here? About ten minutes. Well, then I'll have time to send a telegram to my Aunt Clara. And if you'll excuse me, I have to see the conductor about switching off my private car. I'll see you in the station. Sure, see you in the station, Mr. Gardner. Oh, Joe. Joe, come here a minute. Well, Mr. Gardner, got you here on time like I promised. Fine trip, Joe. little present for you. A hundred dollars? Well, thanks. 
I'd like to ask you something, Joe. Your usual stop here is 10 minutes, isn't it? That's right. I'd consider it a personal favor, Joe, if you took this train out of here and say, uh, two minutes? Think you can do that? You can do most anything for $100, Mr. Gardner. She'll be down the road in two minutes flat. Thanks, Joe. Sure, looks like it, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Master. I was told the train would be here for ten minutes. So was I, ma'am. Appears to me we've been misinformed. Oh, well, when's the next train to Kansas City? Three days. Oh, Christmas. Howdy. We've missed our train. Yes, ma'am. Well, what are you grinning at? Well, it's none of my business, but I believe you're happy about it. Well, why on earth should I be happy? Him? Why, you... <laughs> He was right, you know. A lot more exciting here than in, San in Kansas City. Yep. I believe we're going to like it here. You know, I believe I am happy. Why, well, I actually believe I am. Sure you are. Lucky you left your luggage in Gardner's car. Come on, we'll pick it up. Oh, well, please don't bother about me, Mr. Uh, Summers, Dan Summers. Summers, I can look out for myself beautifully. Well, my granny always said next to eating peas with a sharp knife ain't nothing so risky as a pretty girl looking out for herself. Your granny and I don't agree. Oh, there he is now. Uh, Mr. Gardner. My kitten, what happened? The most terrible thing. The train went off and just left me here. Us here. I think that's wonderful. I was hoping that would happen. But what'll I do? Yeah, what'll we do? Don't worry about it, kitten. And don't you either, cowboy. Cherokee. Yeah, boss. Crank that automobile and let's go. Uh, is it safe? Runs like a deer. Come on. Goodbye, Mr. Summers. Goodbye. Thanks, Mr. Gardner. I'll see you around. Most people do. Goodbye. Will you please take me to the hotel, Mr. Gardner? Sure, I live there. And until that train comes in for Kansas City, kitten, you're going to school. I don't go to school. I teach school. This isn't Claiborne. Here you go to school. And the teacher's name is James E. Gardner. <laughs> Well, honey, how do you like the room? Lovely, Miss Baxter. Thank you. Say, what brought you here anyway? Mm, I was bored, I guess. Mm-hmm. Just off the farm? School teacher. Come again? School teacher. Oh, that's what I thought you said. Now, right there down the hall is Jim Gardner's room. Like to see it? What? Well, honey, I don't get it. Well, neither did Mr. Gardner until I slapped his face. You slapped Jim Gardner's face? I most certainly did. Oh, honey, that's the best news in years. I got to hear this from the beginning. <laughs> well, there's nothing to tell. I, I met him on the train, and then when I missed my other train, I just came here. And he still goes for you? If you mean, did he bring me here, yes. I'll be gone. Confidentially, I'm glad I missed the train, but I wouldn't want him to think I'm the sort of a girl who'd let herself be glad and, and not have a chaperone. Well, you got one. Meet a new member of your family, Aunt Bessie. Oh, <laughs> Bessie, you're wonderful. <laughs> you're crazy about the big guy, ain't you? You know, he's exactly like that wonderful Roger Hale in my book. You wrote a book? Most well, certainly. Good glory. In my book, Roger leads Julie into a new world filled with exciting adventure. And they got married, lived happily ever after? Well, of course. <laughs> well, you got the right idea, honey. But when you're shooting for orange blossoms with Jim Gardner, you're playing for the highest stakes there is. Well, that's what he told me to do. Oh, uh, where'd he go? Down the cellar in the bathtub room. Him and the young fella. Like for you to meet him. Dan Summers. Oh, I know Mr. Summers, too. You do? Surely. Oh, honey, you're either the smartest or the dumbest school teacher I ever met up with. <laughs> Little Joe the Wrangler, he'll never wrangle more. His days with the Ramuda, they are done. Was a year ago last April that he joined hey, the Hey, you. Here. You're behind the petition. Is that you, cowboy? That's right, Mr. Gardner. That sure feels good, huh? Yeah, you sing pretty nice, too. Thanks. Ain't finished her yet. Next morning, just at sunup, we found where Rocket fell. Down in a washout 20 feet below. Beneath his horse mashed to a pulp, his fur had rung the nail. For our little Texas stray, poor Angler Joe. Kind of sad, ain't it? I rather liked it. Thanks. The steers always liked it, too. Cherokee. Yeah, boss. Come here. Scrub my back. Say, cowboy. Yeah. I'm going to give you $200. To scrub your back? No, to leave town. That's a lot of money. Yeah, but then I like you. I like you so much that I'm paying you to get out instead of having you thrown out. You are, huh? Yeah, is it a deal? 
You see, I don't like competition in oil wells or ladies. Oh, I don't think you have any competition. I'll think about your offer, though. Just make sure your mind's made up by the time you're dressed. They'd driven to Red River, and the weather had been fine. They were camped down on the south side. Hey, what do you mean, putting on boss clothes? Hey, take them off clothes. What's the idea, cowboy, stealing my clothes? Oh, I figure you'd give me $200, and, well, I thought that was a little too much, and so I'm getting your clothes, and you settled them for them. Are you going to take them off, or does Cherokee take over? Well, I sure like these clothes, Mr. Gardner. Go to work, Cherokee. Sure, boss. Don't make trouble, cowboy. Don't want bullet hole in boss clothes. Put down that gun, Injun. No, put down gun. You put down clothes. Okay. I guess you win. You want his gun, Mr. Gardner? No. You want a job? Yeah. You got one. I overestimated Cherokee. He's fired. You're my new bodyguard. Oh, uh, uh, these clothes go with it? Okay. Then I'm hired. So long as I don't have to wash your back. The first thing for you to do is find Miss Allen. Tell her I'll meet her tonight at 8 o'clock. Right. 8 o'clock. We'll be waiting for her, won't we? In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille presents Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in Act Two of In Old Oklahoma. And now, it's teenage business. Why, Ellen, you look lovely. What have you been doing to your skin? Oh, thank you, Mary. It does seem to work, doesn't it? What seems to work? Don't be tantalizing. Why, those beauty facials I've been taking like mad, of course. You said... Of course I did. I said your skin looks divine. What I want to know is, silly, what beauty facials? Oh, of course. Uh, I forgot you weren't taking them. But you really should, you know. Of course I should. Now, please tell me what beauty facials. Do they cost much? How long do they take? How long before my skin will look as lovely as yours? Rita Hayworth takes them. Loretta Young takes them. Betty Grable takes them. Veronica Lake, Rosalind Russell, Dorothy Lamour. Practically every star in Hollywood. Nine out of ten of them. Because they get results. Really make skin lovelier in a short time. Why doesn't somebody hurry and say what beauty facials? Do they cost much? Where do I get the things I need? How long do they take? Hollywood beauty facials, the Lux soap facials that really make skin more beautiful, are inexpensive, quick, and easy to take. Just cover your face generously with a rich Lux soap lather. Work it in gently but thoroughly. Rinse with warm water and splash with cold. Pat with a nice soft towel to dry. Your skin feels better already. Recent tests prove that regular facials with Lux toilet soap improved actually three out of four complexions. This mild white soap with active lather really does things for the skin. It's on the shopping list of lovely women everywhere. In New York, in Alabama. In Texas, in Oregon. In Hollywood, nine out of ten screen stars use it. Why don't you ask your dealer for Hollywood's beauty soap? If he's temporarily out of stock due to wartime conditions, He's sure to have more soon. Remember, Lux Toilet Soap is worth waiting for. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act Two of An Old Oklahoma, starring Martha Scott as Kathy, Roy Rogers as Dan Summers, and Albert Decker as Jim Gardner. <laughs> Catherine Allen is determined to leave for Kansas City in three days. But secretly, she is equally determined to make those three days unforgettable. A conviction ardently shared by Jim Gardner. Jim gets off to a perfect start by taking the righteous little school teacher to her first cabaret. But at the table for two, a third party is waiting for them. Jim's new bodyguard, Dan Summers, is taking his job very seriously. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Summers. Say, Mr. Gardner, this is sure some place. Nothing better this side of Chicago. I ought to know I own it. You can run along now, Summers. But I got to look out for your interest, boss. If I'm going to be your bodyguard, I figure that, well, I got to guard your body. Go on, get out. You mean you want me to go? Definitely. Okay, I can take a hint. Jim, maybe he should stay. Now, what on earth? Well, she means that a man like you, Mr. Gardner, who's made so much money so quickly is, well, you're apt to have a few enemies. A few? I've got dozens. Now get. Okay, I'm getting. 
Good night. Good night. Well, kitten, like to dance before the champagne comes? Champagne? Oh, Christmas. <laughs> That's just what I'm going to make these three days for you, honey. One long and beautiful Christmas. I hear bells ringing already, Jim, without the champagne. That Jim Gardner sure can pick him. Ah, my. Break the lala for losing. Right, Dana, Dana Summers. Yahoo! Oh, Dalton, how are you? Dana, where have you been? Oh, down around Cuba, Philippines. Smelled oil all the way down there, did you? Oil? Oil don't interest me, Dalton. Hey, 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 what you looking at? Oh, Gardner's got a new gal, huh? Yeah. Well, what's up, Dalton? I've been hearing rumors that... You're getting kind of soft-hearted. Yeah? Who started that? Don't know, but there's a real charitable act you could do for me. Well, you know me, Daniel. Well, I sure wish I was sitting at Jim Gardner's table right now. Yeah. You see, I'm Jim's new bodyguard, and I figure if someone was to attack him, and, and I should save his life, well, I figure that... You... Leave it to me and my boy, son. Just leave it to me. The waiter just brought the champagne, kitten. We'll finish the dance later, hmm? And flowers. Oh, Jim. They're not going to look like much when you're next to them, honey. <laughs> it's another word. <laughs> all right, Gardner, all right. You've been asking for this, and now you're going to get it. Jim! What are you talking about, Dalton? You're a double-crossing liar and a cheap crook. He's not cheap. Drop that gun, Dalton. I'd sure hate to drill you in the back. Now you keep out of this, cowboy. I said drop that gun. That's better. Gardner may be a fast-talking floor flusher, but... Nobody's going to kill him when I'm around. Well, I guess you win, cowboy. Desperate, Blackman. Uh -huh. Get this man out of here. Come along, Dalton. We got law and order here, and we mean to enforce it. Get going. Here. Yes, I guess you got me, boys. I don't know what come over me. Hey, start the music and get back to your table, folks, and let's have a good time. Jimmy might have killed you. I don't understand it. I always played ball with the Dalton. I tried to warn you, Mr. Gardner, but you're too trusty. I tell you, this ain't no easy job I walked into. Hey, let's sit down, huh? Yeah, but this is my chair. Sit over there. Well, I couldn't do that. You might get attacked again. And my granny always says it's impolite to shoot across a lady. All right, Summers. As long as you're here, we may as well talk business. Tomorrow afternoon, we're driving out to the Indian Reservation. Good. I got some friends out there I'd like to see again. The richest oil lands in Oklahoma owned by those Indians. I want to buy them. They'll be glad to sell them, Jim. Surely they're not worth anything to the Indians. <laughs> Brush up on your sign language, kitten. Maybe you can convince him of that. <laughs> Have you seen the government man yet? The engine agent? You mean Mason? Yeah. He's sure a square shooter, Mr. Gardner. What are you trying to say? That I'm not? I've spoken to Mason, and we're not going to have any trouble. Well, still, I think we ought to keep Miss Allen at home. Oh, I don't mean there'd be any danger. It's, it's just that engines don't fancy ladies hanging around when they're talking business. Oh, well, I guess you can sit in the automobile, kitten, while we do the palavering. Of course, if it'll make Mr. Summers happy. Too bad, though. I figured our powwow might be pretty interesting to a writer. Who's a writer? Miss Allen. I think you were reading her book on the train. You mean uh, a woman there? Mm -hmm. that's... that's right, Mr. Summers. Remember? A dried up old maid who'd run a mile if a man even looked at her. Oh. Better find a doctor, Summers. Doctor? Yeah. Looks to me like you've been clawed by a baby wildcat. Daniel Summers? Uh, where have you been? In the army, Big Tree. But I think I'll be sticking around now for a while. Uh, that's good, Dan. Leave your home. Not good, leave home. And this is Jim Gardner, Big Tree. Big white chief of Sepulpa. Mm. He asked for powwow? That's right, Big Tree. I want to be your friend. Be your friend, Dan? Sure, him like Big Wind. He speaks grass, tree, rabbit, everything gold. Big man, powerful. White chief, speak. Well, Big Tree, your tribe owns much land. This land has only trees and rocks. Hunting here is no good anymore. Buffalo gone now. Your sons will be poor and hungry. I want to buy that land from you. Mm, it's land no good. Why you won't buy? Because I want to get what is under the land. Oil. Make big pile of money. And my people, what they get? Money, too. From every dollar I make, I'll give your people 12 and a half cents. It's like this, big tree. I know. If we sell you land, my people get every day thousand dollars. That's it, from land that is worthless to you now. Dan, what do you say? I'd just soon keep quiet, Big Tree. Go ahead and tell him, Daniel. Well, Big Tree, I, I think you'd be suckered. Sucker? A sucker's what a squirrel is when he lets the woodpecker steal the nuts he's stored up for the winter. Hmm. My friend has spoken. Mason. Yeah? Power over. I no sign paper with white chief. 
That's great work, cowboy. What the devil do you expect to get out of this? Not a raise in pay. Ah, it's on paper with Don Summer. Yeah, Dan? No, Big Tree, I ain't in the oil business. You bet you're not. This doesn't settle a thing. I'm going to get the oil that's on this land. That's enough, Jim. Guess we'd better be going. I'm going. I'm going straight to Washington. Wait for me. I'm driving to Sepulper in my automobile. It's about 20 miles. And if you want to get back, try crawling on your belly. I'm terribly sorry you lost the Indian land, Jim. Oh, but I haven't lost it, kitten. I'll go direct to Washington. I get what I want. Day after tomorrow, I'll be on that train, too, won't I? That's right. I do hope my ticket's correct. Do you think it is? Well, let's stop here a minute, and I'll take a look at it. Here. Oh, it'd be awful if I were left behind again, wouldn't it? Sure would, kitten. Sure would. But, Jim, you're tearing up my ticket. Oh. You didn't really think I'd let you get away from me, did you? Oh, I wasn't sure. I'm crazy about you. You know it. Oh, Jim. Last time I did that, you slapped me. Sorry about the ticket? If you hadn't torn it up, I would have. On my train, you don't need tickets. I'm the conductor and the engineer. And I'll take you to all the places you've ever dreamed of. I don't care whether we go to the moon or stay right here. As long as we're always together, Jim. Always, kitten? That's a pretty long time. Forever, darling. You know, I've got an idea you're going to interest me for quite a while. But wherever that place is along the line and you get tired of the scenery, just jump off. Is that the way we travel? The only way I ever travel. I promise you, you won't be the loser. I'm sure I won't be the loser, Jim. Because I'm getting off right here. What are you talking about? I'm sorry, Jim. I guess we sort of misunderstood each other. Oh, now, wait a minute. Goodbye. Oh, but you can't walk back to town. I wouldn't bet any money on that if I were you. All right, then walk. And when you reach the pupper, you'll know where to find me. Oh, hello. Hello. You borrowed this horse and buggy out there from the Indians. Come on, get in. No, thank you. Well, you mind if I drive alongside you? It's a free road, isn't it? Yep. Mighty lonesome one, too. Oh, well. I've learned a lot about women from a certain girl I know. She's held my hand and knows my brand. Still, I don't seem to have a show. Now I've been on the level, I know the golden rule, but she keeps on acting like an army mule. I've learned a lot about women, if women are all like you, keep on a-walking, if women are all like you. Boots, boots, pick them up and lay them down. Boots, boots, marching into town. Hold your pretty chin up and keep on hiking, sister, cause your little tootsies are heading for a blister. I've learned a lot about women, if women are all like you, I'll take the army if women are all like you. Boy, I sure can sing awful pretty, huh? I wouldn't know. I wasn't listening. Well, what are you doing a long way out here? It's going to be dark in a few minutes. What does it look like I'm doing? Wandering around out here ain't exactly safe, you know. I've told you before I can take care of myself. Well, you better keep an eye out for rattlesnakes and wolves and skunks. Oh, well, come on, horse. Get on it. Get up. Oh, Dan! Dan! Mr. Summers, wait for me! It's a wolf! <laughs> Thanks, old coyote. <laughs> Whoa, boy. Oh. oh. I've changed my mind. Hmm. I was hoping you would. Get in. Can I help you? Oh, thank you. Dan. Mm, that's better. What? Jim told me the Indians offered you the oil lease. Yep. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. That's what I thought. Why? Well, with those Indian lands, you could really do something worthwhile. Well, I never gave it much thought one way or the other. You want to be a cowboy all your life? Don't you realize you could be big, bigger than anyone around here? <laughs> Look, little lady, would you be satisfied if I just went back and punched Jim Gardner right in the nose? Women. Come on, horse, get on into town. There he is. Daniel, come on in here. Hey, 
what the dickens is this? Well, you're going to make us all rich. <laughs> Look, Desperate, I just come back from the Indian Reservation. Now, what are you talking about? Stone, let me shake the hand that shook the pulpa. We heard all about it. And we want you to take the oil lease with the Indians. The whole town's backing you against Jim Dodd. Yeah. Well, I said I didn't want it, and that still goes. You're the only one the Indians are leased to. But don't you see, after what I told Big Tree, if I went and took the lease now, it'd be kind of like double-crossing Gardner. Gardner does everything legal, Daniel. That's true. But he's taught us that a man can cheat and lie and still be legal. And we're getting sick and tired of him making money off in our oil land. Right. Yeah, but drilling oil wells takes money and lots of it. And that's what we're trying to tell you, Dan. We raise the money. Us little fellas, Daniel. It'll be us and the engines instead of Gardner. What do you say? Don't let us down, Summer. But sure, we got some rights. No, I just ain't the man for the deal. Of course you are. Huh? Well, I know this is none of my business, but you're just the man. Jim Gardner says he'll get the Indian lands and he's going to Washington to do it. Well, if he can, you can. And if you don't think anything of yourself, Dan Summers, think of these people. If you work those lands, you'll give us all a chance. Well, we can lick that Jim Gardner to a frazzle. Well, I know how you folks feel and I'd like to please you, but still, I gotta sleep on the proposition. So well, well, that's good enough for me. Inside, everybody. Drinks on the house and dance until midnight. Come here, girl. Yeah? Ain't you taking kind of a roundabout trip for them orange blossoms, honey? Ask me, Dan. I'll ask you. Will you dance? Oh, about everything else has happened to me. Come on, we'll dance. I'm not made of glass, you know. Huh? I won't break. Oh, <laughs> this better? Much. Well, I'm warning you, my feet ain't half as light as my head. <laughs> You're a fine dancer, Dan. Yes, Summers. You seem to understand all about dancing. Oh, hello, Mr. Gardner. But this is to warn you to stay out of things you don't understand. Oh, hey, what? Stand back, folks! Give him some air! Stand back! Come on! Stand back. Hey, what happened? Three guesses, son. Gardner? Give the gent a cigar. He sure put you to sleep, Dan. <laughs> well, I guess I've slept on that proposition long enough. How do I get to Washington? <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Albert Decker for Act Three of In Old Oklahoma. And now, there's a little conference going on between two young war workers who share an apartment. It's my turn to do the marketing this week, Marion. Just check the list, though, will you? Mm, let's see. Oranges, bread, coffee, eggs, toilet soap. Oh, Janie, dear, do me a special favor, won't you, and get some lots? Oh, sure, but isn't that soap in the bathroom all right? Oh, it's all right, but it isn't super the way Lux is. I want a soap for my bath that really lathers. We know what Marion means. Sometimes it seems like hard work to coax lather out of soap. It seems a little bit like this, in fact. But now, unwrap a smooth white cake of Lux toilet soap. In a jiffy, as soon as you touch it to water, you get a quick, creamy lather like this. That wonderful creamy Lux lather is one reason why so many Hollywood stars use their complexion soap as a bath soap, too. Lovely women everywhere say a Lux soap beauty bath whisks away every trace of the day's dust and dirt. Leaves skin fresh, really sweet. It's nice to know that active lather makes you really sure of daintiness. And I love the delicate fragrance Lux soap leaves on my skin. A bath soap that's luxurious, but thrifty, too. Lux toilet soap is hard mill. That means you can use it down to the thinnest sliver. It's patriotic not to waste soap now, you know. So here's another thrift tip. Always put your Lux toilet soap in a soap dish that's dry. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. We'll have a chat with a cowboy and a lady after the play. But now we raise the curtain on the third act of In Old Oklahoma, starring Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Albert Decker. Several weeks have gone by 
since Kathy's plea and Jim Gardner's fists swept Dan Summers into the oil business. Back from Washington, both men impatiently await the government's decision. It arrives in Sepulpa in the form of two identical telegrams. One to Dan and one to Albert Fenton, Jim Gardner's lawyer. They turned you down, Jim. They turned you down. Read me the last of that telegram again. This grant to Daniel Summers shall be null and void unless a minimum of 10,000 gallons of oil are delivered to the refinery at Tulsa, Oklahoma by next August 31st. If these conditions are not met, the leasing rights will be awarded to James E. Gardner. Now, well, there it is, Jim. Yeah. It's perfectly obvious why we lost out. Summers agreeing to give the Indians 50% of the profit. Oh, calm down, Fenton. That's his privilege. Besides, the telegram gives him only four months. Well, that's what he asked for in Washington, four months. And that's where he made his mistake. It just can't be done in four months. Let's play it safe, Jim. Let's make certain he fails. No. I'm giving him the same chance the government's giving him. And I can't lose. <laughs> We've hit it. Let's see. There. Smell this sand. This gas fumes all right. And that means oil. It gotcha. It means we've won. Sure it does, Daniel. Today's only August 8th. That gives us three whole weeks to pipe it into Tulsa. Well, we're celebrating tonight, Desperate. Now get on into town. Bessie promised she'd come out here and feed us the best dinner in Sepulpa the day we hit oil. I guess Miss Al would be kind of interested in the news, too. Hey, look, Daniel. Ain't that that engine who used to work for Gardner? Yeah. You looking for somebody, Cherokee? Look for you. One job. Mosey on, Desperate. I'll take care of him. Yeah, see you later, Daniel. Right. Why don't you ask your old boss for a job, Cherokee? Gardner, bad man. You good man. You work for Indian, I work for you. You really serious about working? Sure. Me good worker. Now, let's see how good you are unloading these barrels. Get busy and we'll talk later. Sure, boss. I just done my tour. Now get a hold of that there guitar and give us a song. Come on. <laughs> I'm a holding up the fried chicken till you do, Dan. Well, I can't let my boys starve. They call this one when my blue moon turns to gold. Memories that linger in my heart. Memories that make my heart grow cold. But someday they'll live again, sweetheart. And my blue moon again will turn to gold When my blue moon turns to gold again When the rainbow turns the clouds away When my blue moon turns to gold again You'll be back in my arms to stay The lips that used to thrill me so your kisses were meant for only me. In my dream, they live again, sweetheart. And my golden moon is just a memory. When my blue moon turns to gold again, when the rainbow turns the clouds away, when my blue moon turns to gold again, You'll be back in my arms to stay. I got something for you, Kathy. A bottle of sand. Oil sand. It's really a bottle full of rainbows. I always make a wish when I see a rainbow. I'll make one for both of us. Do you mind? Any way you want it, that's the way I want it. Hadn't we better go get Bessie some help? Well, I was hoping we could talk. You never talk, Dan. Well, that's because my granny always says the second fiddler's got to wait his turn before he can sing out good and loud. Dan. If you'd made the wish, what would it have been? Well, you know that bend in the river where the cottonwoods are? Uh-huh. I'd build me a house right there. Well, I didn't know you ever thought of such things. Oh, I thought about them ever since I was a kid. Smoke coming out of the chimney, horses in the corral, and the best herd of cattle in Oklahoma. 
But now that I'm pretty near a dashing tycoon, things will be different. Bigger house, more cattle, and a fancy stable instead of that old pole corral. Is that all you want? Well, what else is there? Oh, Dan, if I were going to be a dashing tycoon, I'd be dashing. I'd have automobiles and private railroad cars, and if I found someone I wanted, I'd sweep her right off her feet. I'd take her with me right to the end of the line. You, you would, huh? I most certainly would. I... Oh. Why, Dan. You know, I, I'm going to like this dashing tycoon business. <laughs> Kathy? I, I sure would like to kiss you again. Get back, Kathy! Get back! Dad, Dad. There goes a railroad, Captain. There goes a rainbow. Dad, look at the flames. Two men. They'll burn to death. Send for a doctor, quick. I'm going to get him out of there. What are you trying to tell me, Cherokee, that you did it? Sure. Use dynamite. Everything blew up. Oil well dairy. All gone. You thought I'd like that? Sure. I know like cowboy, you know like cowboy. Now I get old job back, huh? You crazy fool, I ought to... Who is it? Please let me in, Jim. I've got to do this. Just a minute, kitten. Cherokee, get inside there. Hurry. Sure. Jim, Dan's on his way here. Someone blew up our well. I had nothing to do with it, kitten. Two men were killed, Jim. And you rushed here to warn me. Thanks. But don't worry, there won't be any more killing. Oh, you've beaten us. And now, you've got to stop things before they get any worse. You know, you're more attractive than ever, kitten. Oh, Jim, stop. Let go of me. Where's Cherokee? Better get out of here, cowboy. Where's he, Kathy? Where's Cherokee? I don't know, Dan. There's no one else here. I saw him come up. I want that Indian, Gardner. Wilkins and Todd are dead, and that's going to be paid for if I have to tear you and the whole town apart. Dan, look out! So he wasn't here, Kathy. Dan, I... Gardner, there's only one thing more I want from you. There's a chance we can still operate if I can get hold of a portable oil rig. I'm going to borrow yours. Why don't you go out and take it? That's just what I'm going to do. But first, I'm telling the sheriff why I killed your pet rattlesnake. What are you going to tell him? That you killed Cherokee in self-defense. The same thing I'm going to tell him about you if I find you on my property. Dan, I must talk to you. Why? It's pretty plain you picked the side of the fence you like. Well, stay there. <laughs> How's it going, Desmond? She's going good, Daniel. We'll hit that oil again any minute. Uh, say, you never did tell me how you got this here portable rig. It's Gardner's, ain't it? Yeah, I started a prairie fire. Dan! Yeah! Dan! Gardner's coming, him and about 50 men. We're getting our rifles. Any fight will be between Gardner and me. Get back to the rig and be ready to cap the gut. Okay, Dan. Hello, Summers. I don't suppose you heard about the prairie fire over at my field last night. Put her out? Yeah. When the boys got back, my portable rig was missing. Same rig you're using now. You don't say. All right, men, take down the rig. Get away from that rig. Turn around, Gardner. Look over there at the top of that hill. Oh, yeah, I see. There's about 300 engines up there, Gardner. All I have to do is fire a shot, and they start closing in. Well, I guess we've had a ride out here for nothing. All right, boys, the rig stays put. That's better. But I'm staying a while, cowboy. Stealing a rig is against the law. And I mean to pound that law into your thick head. You put me to sleep once, Gardner. Here's your chance to do it again. Through the pipeline. Yeah, but I just bought the pipeline. You can keep the rig, cowboy. And thanks for the gusher. Let's go, boys. Uh, I thought everything bad that could happen has happened. And now this. Well, we're going to get this oil to Tulsa, Desperate. We'll do it with wagons. Stan, it just can't be done. Round up every horse and every man you can. Get grub. Telegraph relay stations and dig up everything on wheels that'll carry oil. But there ain't half a dozen of them old tanker wagons fit to use. But then we'll build them. There's lumber, there's tar, and there's tonight. 
Hurry up, Desperate. We still got a chance. <laughs> Sandwiches. Leslie's putting it on the wagon. How do you know? Because I've been helping her, that's why. You ask, who asked you to help? Jim Gardner? There are times when I wish I was a man, Dan Summers, and this is one of them. Why, I ought... You picked your own pasture, didn't you? I didn't pick anything. You just took it for granted. I just heard what you said, Daniel. And if we wasn't ready to roll, I'd horse swap you. I doubt if it'd do any good, Desperate. Yeah. Will I see you at the relay station, Kathy? I'll be there, Desperate. Good luck. Good luck, Dan. Well, line up every wagon there is, Desperate. Single file and close together. Told you a minute ago we was all ready. Well, what are you waiting for? All right, boys, climb on your wagon. I don't have to tell you what it means that we reach Tulsa by 6 o'clock tonight. That's the time the refinery closes. Just do your best and remember Sam Wilkins and Johnny Todd. All right, boys, let them roll! <laughs> Summers must have 40, 50 wagons out there. Yeah, Summers did his job well. How well did you do yours? We've got 10 of our men spotted in among his wagons. That means at least 10 of those wagons will never reach Tulsa. That's not enough. I know it, but in about 20 minutes, they'll be right at the mouth of this canyon. And that's as close to Tulsa as they'll ever get. I borrowed an idea from Summers. This. Very fire. Somebody once said you got to fight fire with fire. Good work, Fenton. Give me a handful of those matches. <laughs> Happened to you. Prairie fire, mouth of the canyon. Get busy, desperate, and get those chains changed. And you got through? Well, we're here, Bessie. We left four of the wagon and some of Gardner's men back in the canyon. Bessie, have you seen? Yeah, he's here. Daniel, hurry, you're burned. Come on over to the chuck wagon. Maybe I can help you. If you want to help me, just stay out of my way. Hey, you chuck heads. You've been riding upside down? Well, I just wish some people learned to keep their mouths shut. Well, that's what we promised her we'd do. And that's what caused this trouble. Bessie, please. You thought she went to warn Gardner the day our gusher was dynamited. Well, you lop-eared mule, it was you she was thinking about. Trying to keep you out of trouble. It's all right, Bessie. Just been a little mixed up. Yeah, I guess I am. I'm plenty mixed. It's about time you start unraveling. I'm sorry, Kathy. Awful sorry. Let's not talk about that, Dan. Let's talk about that bend in the river. Those cottonwoods. You remember that? Of course I remember in the house in the pole corral. Yeah. Boys here say Gardner's in Tulsa. That means he'll be helping Witherspoon close them gates right on the dot of six. Hey, did I hear the name Witherspoon? Charlie Witherspoon? He's superintendent of the refinery at Tulsa. And he's the one who's going to close them gates? That's right. Oh, over my dead body, and it ain't dead yet. Come on, honey. You and me has work to do. Where's my buggy? Goodbye, Dan. See you in Tulsa. At six o'clock. All right, Desperate. Let's get rolling. Don't you think we ought to wait till they hit the horses? Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, go right in, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Witherspoon is expected. Thanks. Oh, uh, hello there, Mr. Gardner. Say, pretty nearly five o'clock. Looks like you'll get those Indian lands. It's all over but the celebrating, Charlie. Come on, get your hat. Oh, uh, you can't leave. You've got a closing time, Mr. Gardner. That's right, Charlie. Stick to your principles. But at least you can have a drink with me, can't you? I brought along something very special. Mm, my, my. You know, Charlie, I got some big plans for the future. And you're in them, Charlie, because I like a man with principles. You mean that, Mr. Gardner? I always say what I mean. Well, let's drink to the future. To the future and the Indian land. Charlie, take another drink. Sure, Jim. But I just about drunk out of the whole bottle already. I'm going to buy out this refinery soon, and you and I are going to go a long ways together. Long, long, long ways, Jim. Look at your watch, Charlie. Hmm? Why, it's six o'clock. Come on, lock up, Charlie, and we'll paint the town. Ready to roost the comb. Charlie, Charlie Witherspoon. Huh? It's Bessie. Oh, Charlie, how are you? How you doing? <laughs> Bessie Baxter. Well, don't cry, Charlie. <laughs> oh, I'm just glad to see you, Bessie. <laughs> Meet my friend, Kathy Allen. <laughs> how do you do, Mr. Witherspoon? And Jim Gardner. Charlie, I don't like to interrupt this little reunion, but it's after six. That's and... right. 
uh, wait here where the ladies not close up. I'll be right back and we'll all celebrate. <laughs> Charlie, that's just what you told me 15 years ago and you never come back. This time I'm going with you. Aren't you going to congratulate me, Skippy? Before the fight's over. The fight is over. The cowboy was licked before he started. Oh, look, honey, you and I have wasted a lot of time. Let's get back on that train. This time we'll go straight to the end of the line with no stopover. Except at Niagara Falls. What do you say? I got off that train a long time ago, Jim. I'm trying to catch a ride on a cowboy's wagon, and here it comes. Look! Alex! Alex! Yes, Mr. Gardner? Where did Witherspoon go? He had been back to left a minute ago. Where? Well, she said she was taking him for a buggy ride. <laughs> this office still open? Yes, indeed. We're open till Mr. Witherspoon gets back. We got 10,000 gallons of oil here to check in. Yes, I'll get the full of Oh, Dan. <laughs> I bet you're going to say you knew all along I'd do it. Of course I am, and it's true, Dan, so wonderfully true. Just like in the book, huh? No, just like in my dream. Well, cowboy, you made it. But you can't bring in oil every day with a horse and wagon. Now, I've got a pipeline. I've got a proposition for you. We'll take it up in my office when I get one. Why not right now, in there, with a spoon's office? Sure. Excuse me, Kathy. Hey, Kathy, where'd Daniel go? He's in conference with Jim Gardner. That's the most interesting conference I ever heard. <laughs> well, Dan, what did you decide? Nothing yet. I presented an idea to Gardner, and he's sleeping on it. <laughs> I got one to present to you, too, Kathy. You stock that there lady, and I'll pin you for a hold. <laughs> oh, put down your gun, Desperate. This idea is about a house by the river. Oh, well, guess I'll sit down inside and just look at Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> we could put on an extra room, Dan. Huh? Why? So your granny could come and live with us? Oh, uh, just one catch to that. What? I never had a granny in my life. <laughs> you see, she was only a, uh, uh... Poetic license? Yeah, you know, like they kissed and suddenly the sun and the moon... And, and the stars reeled around them. Is that still the silliest thing you ever heard of, Dad? Well, I ain't so sure right now. Let's find out, huh? Well, Mr. Summers? Honey, uh, where can I get one of them licenses? <laughs> From old Oklahoma, we turn to present day Hollywood. And a curtain call for Martha Scott. Roy Rogers and Albert Decker. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It's a pleasure to be back. There was only one disappointment. Roy didn't bring his horse, Trigger. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that, Martha. Trigger will be mighty pleased to know that you're an admirer of his. <laughs> well, I have a horse, too, Roy, but I'm afraid I don't ride as well as you do. Where did you get acquainted with horses, Roy? I was raised on a ranch, Albert. Radio must seem a little tame to a real riding, roping cowboy. No, I think radio is a wonderful thing. Now, look how many people tried Lux because, well, because they heard about it on this program. <laughs> well, you've got to remember, Roy, that a lot of women made the same discovery I did, that Lux soap is a grand complexion care. That's why we women keep on using it. Yeah, but radio's the way they found out. I really owe a lot to radio. A bunch of fellas and I, well, they were all cowboys. We had a band, and we were broadcasting over a little radio station down in New Mexico a few years ago. And one day we happened to mention on the air that... Well, some good old home-cooked food would come in mighty handy. As a matter of fact, we weren't eating very regular, and, and that's when I decided that radio was really wonderful. <laughs> well, did it, did it bring in a few good old New Mexico hamburgers? It sure did. One girl sent me personally two lemon pies. Boy, the kind you really dream about. And then I went around to the house to thank her, and not only was she a good cook, but just she was pretty, too. <laughs> What would you have done, Mr. DeMille? A beautiful girl who made beautiful lemon pie? <laughs> if I'd been in your place, Roy, I'd have married her. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, my regards to Mrs. Rogers. And uh, you might, uh, well, you might tell her I like lemon pie, too. <laughs> yes, sir. Say, uh, what kind of a play do you have next week, Mr. DeMille? That was a fine drama, Roy. And a four-star cast. It's the Warner Brothers screenplay, 
the hard way. And our stars will be Rancho Tone, Miriam Hopkins, Ann Baxter, and Chester Morris. The Hard Way is a backstage story of the theater. A story of two women, sisters. One in search of fame, and one in search of love. I like the picture very much, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We certainly struck oil tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Miriam Hopkins, Rancho Tone, Chester Morris, and Ann Baxter in The Hard Way. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from... Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, this month marks the 32nd anniversary of the Campfire Girls. A fitting time for the nation to salute their fine record of service in both war and peace. And here's an important wartime job for every housewife in the land. Save every drop of used fat from your kitchen. Turn them into your butcher. He'll give you two meat ration points and four cents a pound for them. Remember, those waste fats will be put right to work to make life-saving medicines for our fighting men. Roy Rogers appeared through the courtesy of Republic Pictures and is currently starred in Hands Across the Border. Albert Decker appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of Lady in the Dark. The screenplay in Old Oklahoma, which was heard tonight, has no connection with the Theater Guild's Broadway musical hit, Oklahoma. Heard in tonight's play were Martha, Martha Wentworth as Bessie, Jim Nusser as Cherokee, and Stanley Farrar, Eddie Marr, Ken Christie, Bob Haynes, Noreen Gamil, Charles Seal, Horace Murphy, Norman Field, Leo Cleary, and John McIntyre. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of In Old Oklahoma has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty care that nine out of 10 Hollywood stars use to help keep their complexions beautifully clear and smooth. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Francho Tone, Miriam Hopkins, Ann Baxter, and Chester Morris in The Hard Way. Everybody, young, old, or in between, your druggist has a free gift for you, free Vim. He'll hand you a regular 50-cent package of Vim's free when you buy the large economy size, a two and a quarter value for $1.69. With famous Vim's, you get all essential vitamins and vitally needed minerals, too. Don't wait to get your free Vim. Complete satisfaction guaranteed or money back. Hurry. Ask for free Vim today. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.